Hi, my name is Emma Shelmadine and I'm the Senior Medical Writer here at Lymphoma Action. I'm delighted to be joined by Kim Linton, Consultant Oncologist at the Christie in Manchester. So today we're going to talk about the topic of active monitoring. Kim, maybe you could start just by telling us what active monitoring is and maybe touch upon the other terms that people might refer to it. Thanks, Emma. Active monitoring is careful observation of follicular lymphoma without immediate treatment. That's sometimes called active surveillance and also called watchful waiting. Yeah, so the key thing to active monitoring is that there are no immediate advantages to treatment and indeed no disadvantages to treatment. So we conducted a very large study in the UK, uh, which looked at several hundred patients who were allocated either to active monitoring or to immediate treatment uh, with the chemotherapy of the day. The people in the active monitoring arm delayed their treatment until they developed symptoms or other reasons to consider treatment. And these people were then followed for a total of 16 years. The important thing to say there is that there was no difference in survival between the two groups of people. So in other words, the people who underwent immediate active monitoring had no disadvantage to that approach. And that is key. The other thing to say about the active monitoring arm is that uh, people were able to delay the need for treatment by on average two to three years. So it's very important to be able to sort of by that time before you need to consider treatment. One in five people didn't need any treatment at 10 years, and that increased to two in five people if they were over the age of 70. So you mentioned follicular lymphoma. We know there are lots of different types of lymphoma. Are there any other types of lymphoma or other cancers where active monitoring is used as an approach? Oh, absolutely. So all of the low-grade lymphomas, if they are asymptomatic and low tumor burden, can be monitored. And that includes CLL and uh, mantle cell lymphoma, Waldenstrom's, all of the low-grade lymphomas. But there are other examples in cancer, like prostate cancer and multiple myeloma, for example, where active monitoring is also entirely appropriate, as long as the same conditions are met. I'll just run through those because it's quite helpful to understand the, the background to this. So essentially, people should have either no symptoms or very few symptoms and certainly no symptoms that are impacting on their quality of life or their ability to do things. The disease burden should be low and we can evaluate that on a scan. Uh, there shouldn't be any significant abnormal blood counts, so no significant anemia, for example, and no disease that's causing any problems to the surrounding structures, so not putting pressure on any of the surrounding structures, for example, and again, we can pick that up on a scan. So under those circumstances, treating the disease when you're not really alleviating any symptoms or changing the survival pattern of the disease really doesn't have any advantage to the patient, and it's much better to be able to say, well, actually, you don't need treatment now. We can spare you those unnecessary side effects, but let's monitor the disease really closely and work out between us when the right time is to initiate treatment, when one of those conditions are met, basically. Maybe we could talk a little bit about the practicality. So you talk about carefully monitoring. What does that involve? It's really important that people are brought back for follow up. And that will be on a semi-structured basis. It might be every three to six months initially. Um, but it's important that people know that they should get in touch between appointments if they develop any new symptoms, any new lumps, for example, that are worrying them, because then it can be checked out between those appointments. And, you know, we don't tend to do scans all the time, but it is quite important to do scans in the beginning. So I, for example, might do two or three scans in the first couple of years just to assess the pace of the disease. And if the disease really isn't growing in that time and the patient's remaining very well, we have a bit of confidence that we could probably watch the disease and not necessarily have to do lots of scans. On the other hand, if the disease is starting to grow quickly, we might increase the frequency of monitoring, we might do more scans, we might even do another biopsy to make sure that the disease isn't becoming more aggressive. But we can't be there all the time to know what's happening to a person. And this is why it's so important that the, the patient themselves understands that, that part of the success of active monitoring is them knowing that it's not just that they can get in touch, but that they must get in touch. So have the phone number for the specialist nurse, have their email address, have the contact details so that they can get in touch. 
we rely on people telling us what's happening to them to make decisions about what to do next. So if someone phones in and says, I've had a new symptom for two weeks, I don't know what it is, I'm worried it could be lymphoma, that would trigger an appointment. It might also trigger a scan or some blood tests, depending on what that is. So the success of active, active monitoring is having that really clear partnership between the clinician and the patient, knowing that they can and must get in touch if there's any changes. And then we know the opportune time in which to start some therapy. How long is someone likely to be on active monitoring? So from the large studies that we've done, on average, it's about two to three years, um, but it varies enormously. So, you know, somebody with a very low pace of disease, we know that two in five people won't need any treatment by 10 years, especially if they're over the age of 70. You know, it might be that for some people, particularly older people, and remember that follicular lymphoma is predominantly a disease diagnosed in older people, they may never need treatment for their follicular lymphoma. It isn't a consideration, but it's a real advantage not to have to consider treatment in an older person, A, if they don't need it, and B, to spare them the side effects that are unnecessary. How do you go about advising somebody who's just been diagnosed with follicular lymphoma that they might go on to um, a period of active monitoring? That's the critical question, isn't it? I think you've got to say to the person that, yes, they've got a diagnosis of follicular lymphoma, but if they don't have any symptoms or they don't have a significant burden of disease on their scan, they don't have any abnormal blood test results, they don't have any sites of disease that are causing a particular local problem, then there are no advantages to them starting treatment because the purpose of treatment, if you like, is to alleviate symptoms and to debulk disease. And if it's not big to start off with and they don't have any symptoms, then there's not a lot to treat, but there are of course side effects of treatment which could really compromise their quality of life. So it's important to establish that you do have what we call low tumor burden asymptomatic disease to mean that it's appropriate to then recommend active monitoring. So you do have to have scans and blood tests and a physical examination to make that assessment. Thank you. I think you've described the, the advantages really clearly there. Something we hear at Lymphoma Action regularly is the, the more emotional impact. It can be quite tricky to hear that you have cancer, but it's not going to be treated immediately. Um, do you have any strategies or tips for, for coping with this element? Yeah, we recognise psychologically it's very difficult. On the one hand, you're told you've got cancer. On the other hand, you're told that nothing's going to be done about it. But remember the context here, you know, most people with follicular lymphoma are diagnosed when they have got symptoms. And then when they have got symptoms, often they then need treatment. But this is a disease that evolves over many years. So those people probably had the disease for five years or more before they needed treatment. So somebody who's diagnosed at a much earlier stage might be picked up incidentally if they're having investigations for something else. And in that context, the disease is at a much earlier stage than somebody who starts treatment. So, you know, monitoring that disease for that period of time is not doing them any harm. And remember that the people who do present the symptoms and start treatment do exceptionally well. So, you know, they have an almost normal lifespan. So you can confidently say to a person, you know, we know from the trials that there's no difference between people who start immediate treatment and those who wait. And we also know from the trials that people who do need treatment do exceptionally well. So I would say to people, if they can put it to the back of their mind, then it is, you know, they're not doing themselves any disadvantages in waiting until they really need treatment and are going to benefit from treatment. One thing we can offer people if they really still struggle with that is, is a treatment with rituximab, which is an, an, an antibody treatment that we use in combination with chemotherapy for people who've got symptoms of people who have what we call high tumor burden disease. But for low tumor burden disease without symptoms, we can just use the rituximab. So avoiding the chemotherapy altogether. And we only use it for four weeks. And that doubles the number of people who don't need treatment in two to three years time. And it means that, you know, 
it takes about 10 years before somebody actually needs to start treatment. So it really pushes that disease much further out at the cost of a very um, straightforward and simple treatment. So for those people who really are struggling conceptually, that's a very nice, uh, low toxicity, quick option. Kim, you mentioned rituximab there. Is that um, commonly available for people on active monitoring? It was nice approved some years ago for people with low tumor burden follicular lymphoma as an option instead of what of active monitoring. So yes, it should be available to all people across the UK. And if in doubt, just speak to your local hospital and your consultant to make sure. And yes, as I mentioned, it's just four weeks of, of rituximab delivered once every week. You mentioned this um, briefly already, but maybe we can talk a little bit more about what might trigger the start of treatment and what um, types of symptoms people should be looking out for whilst on active monitoring? Yes, I think everybody is going to be different in terms of the level of symptoms that they would consider significant for them. And so that's where it, it, it does become a conversation between the patient and their doctor. Um, but generally speaking, the typical symptoms to look out for are night sweats, weight loss and fevers. We call these B symptoms. And if these are problematic, you know, if you're getting night sweats every night or you're losing a lot of weight or starting to feel constitutionally unwell, you know, feeling tired, not having the get up and go that you would normally have, struggling to do your everyday activities, even without B symptoms, that in itself could be a, a trigger to treat. Obviously, if you've got some lymph nodes and, and the places to look out for are the neck, the armpits and the groins, but obviously you can find your tummy might be swelling if you've got lymph nodes inside the abdomen, for example. If these are getting to the stage where they're starting to affect a person, that in itself might be a reason to consider treating. And everyone's threshold is different. So we might say to somebody, look, we've got a, a framework here. You meet the criteria to consider treatment, but it's it's your decision. You know, If the disease has taken quite a long time to get to that point, it might be entirely appropriate to watch it for a little bit longer. But what I would say in those situations is, let's monitor you a little bit more closely. Let's perhaps get another scan in three to six months time. Let's keep an eye on the blood tests and the symptoms because it looks like you're heading towards treatment. But there's usually a degree of flexibility in terms of when we need to start. Um, so if people have got important things that they need to do, we can often accommodate that. The only thing, the only exception I would say is if the disease is growing rather quickly. And that could indicate that the disease is becoming more aggressive. So it's not uncommon for us to say to a follicular lymphoma patient, let's rebiopsy so that we can check the disease. Is it still follicular lymphoma or is it turning into a high grade lymphoma? Because if it is high grade, then we generally get on and treat it um, a little bit quicker. So that's important. So once someone's been on a period of active monitoring and then starts treatment, what kind of treatment could they expect to receive? So typically we would give somebody an antibody treatment in combination with chemotherapy. And the, the two antibodies are rituximab and obinutuzumab. And we choose between them depending on um, the burden of the disease and the characteristics which we can calculate on something called a flippy score. People who have got follicular lymphoma might have heard of that. The types of chemotherapy that we use are generally one of three different combinations. So we can either use CBP or we can use CHOP or we can use bendamustine. So there's basically six different treatments that we could use in the first line treatment. And it's no different for someone who's been on previous watchful waiting compared to somebody who's just been diagnosed with symptomatic follicular lymphoma. And that includes people who've had previous rituximab, just the four weeks of rituximab for low tumor burden disease. They do just as well if they then go on and have either rituximab or obinutuzumab chemotherapy. Their, their responses and outcomes are identical. The, the choice of the different chemotherapies is very much a conversation between the, the patient and their doctor, their lifestyle choices, the side effect profile, uh, and 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 to some extent their age and the burden of the disease, which will help to inform. But there's really no, not a lot of data to guide the choice of therapy. So those factors become important. After you've been on treatment, is it then possible to go back onto active monitoring? Oh, absolutely. So once you've completed the, the chemotherapy and the antibody treatment, 
we call that immunochemotherapy. Normally that's for around six to eight cycles of treatment. And then it might be followed by a period of maintenance where you have the rituximab or the obinutuzumab every few months for a period of two years. And that's been shown to keep the disease in remission for longer. But once you've completed that treatment, providing the disease is under control or in remission, then you go back on watchful waiting and you monitor the disease actively as we've done before for exactly the same changes that we've been looking at. So as long as the disease is at a low burden and not causing any symptoms and the blood count's normal, you continue to have active monitoring until such time as symptoms or disease burden indicate that retreatment is necessary. So whilst on active monitoring, people should obviously be very um, aware of their of their symptoms. Is there anything else practically um, they should be doing? For example, we've we've often asked if somebody is having medical treatment for something else, having a GP appointment or a dentist appointment, should they let their GP or dentist know that they're on active monitoring? I think it's important to let people know that you've got follicular lymphoma or a low grade lymphoma on active monitoring. But by definition, if you're on active monitoring, you shouldn't have abnormal blood tests. So, you know, having dental work, for example, shouldn't be associated with extra bleeding if the platelet count is normal. And if there's any doubt, if there's been a long gap, it's always possible to repeat the blood tests or have a checkup before you have the dental work done. But I think it's it's better to let people know. The other thing to say is even if the disease isn't requiring active treatment, the immune system might still be at a lower ebb. So there might still be some potentially higher risk for complications like infections, for example, if someone's immune system is suppressed because they've got active lymphoma. So it's always worth mentioning that to people. And as I say, if in doubt, getting a, a regular or another review or getting the doctor at the hospital to write a letter to the, to the team. So from everything you've said today, I think key to active monitoring is that communication um, with your medical team. Um, so maybe we could just finish with another point about that and what people should do if they have any concerns about their health whilst on active monitoring. Yes, I think the first thing to say is, you know, don't panic if a new symptom happens. I think a lot of people with uh, a diagnosis like this worry that anything and everything that happens to them from that point onwards is due to their lymphoma. And that's not the case. Um, don't forget, people can still get a cough and a cold and get lymph nodes in the neck or a sore throat. And that doesn't mean that their lymphoma is getting worse. So generally speaking, I would say initially just make a note of it, but monitor the situation. And you know, if, it, if it was, if it is an infection or something else, it'll probably go away. It's really if a symptom is new and persistent. So I generally say to people, look, if it's there for two or three weeks, or getting worse over that time and there's no other explanation, please bring it to our attention. Drop an email to the specialist nurse, pick up the phone, let us know. We at our hospital at the Christie will slot them into our next available appointment and then assess the situation. It is hard for people though, because they're not used to examining themselves and they don't really know what to feel for and what to look for. So I always say to people, if in doubt, just get in touch because it's a learning curve. And knowing, you know, what's normal for them and what should be paid attention to is, 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 is part of that process. So never be shy to get in touch. As I said at the beginning, this act of monitoring only works if people feel confident and comfortable to get in touch with a team. You know, it's not a privilege. It's not a right. It's a mandatory part of active monitoring. And then we know the best time to, to start treatment, really. Kim, I wonder if you could finish just by summarising the key benefits to active monitoring as an approach to managing lymphoma. Thanks, Emma. I think the key take home message is that people are not having immediate treatment because they are not going to benefit from immediate treatment. And important to know that in delaying treatment until they do need it and are going to benefit is not going to affect their lifespan. So you're not doing yourself a disservice by waiting. You're also not going to do, do yourself a disservice in terms of your ability to respond to treatment when you do need it. Thank you, Kim. That's really, really clear. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much, Emma. It's been a pleasure.